Welcome to The Explainer. You know how the economy sometimes feels like a total roller coaster? One minute things are great, the next, well, not so much. Today, we're going to pull back the curtain and look at the actual tool economists use to map that whole ride out. All right, section one, the economic roller coaster. We have all been there. You feel it, right? Those times when jobs are easy to find, everyone's optimistic, and then the other times when every headline is talking about a recession. This whole up and down thing, it actually has a name, the business cycle. And this graph here, it pretty much shows that natural rhythm of the economy. See those upward slopes? Those are expansions. That's when businesses are hiring, they're producing more stuff. And the dips? Those are recessions. So the big, big question for economists is, what's causing these huge swings? And is there anything we can actually do to smooth them out? I mean, think about it. How do you even begin to get a handle on all the millions of things, from what you buy at the store to what's happening with global trade, that can shift an entire country's economy? It sounds impossible, right? Well, economists have a model for that. So let's dive into section two, mapping the economy. To sort through all this complexity, economists use this really powerful framework called the Aggregate Demand slash Aggregate Supply Model, or AD slash AS for short. You can honestly think of it like a GPS for the whole economy. So at its heart, the model is pretty simple. It just plots the overall price of everything against the country's total economic output, all the stuff we make. And by looking at where those two lines cross, we can pretty much diagnose the economy's health and start to understand what's behind things like inflation and unemployment. Okay, section three, the spending equation. Let's start with the first big piece of our map, aggregate demand. And in simple terms, this is just the total demand for everything produced in an economy. It's really the engine of all the spending. And all of that spending gets boiled down to this one super powerful equation. I know, it might look like a bit of alphabet soup, but trust me, each one of these letters represents a huge driver of the economy. Let's break them down one by one. First up is C for consumption. And this is the big one. It's the biggest piece of the puzzle. This is all the spending by households, you know, like you and me. Your morning coffee, your phone bill, the groceries you buy, it all adds up, and it's what really drives the economy day to day. Next up, we've got I for investment. Now, this isn't what you might think, like buying stocks. In economics, investment means spending by businesses on things that are going to help them produce more later on. You know, a factory buying a new robot or a software company building a huge new data center. And this is where it gets really interesting. Just take a look at this chart. The blue bars, those are interest rates. So when they go down, it gets cheaper for businesses to borrow money for those big investments. And just notice how the blue line, which is economic growth, often starts to climb when those interest rates fall. It's a really key lever in the economy. Then you've got G, and that's for government spending. This is when the government itself acts like a huge consumer, buying everything from new highways and fighter jets to paying the salaries of teachers and firefighters. And finally, we have net exports. This part just balances out our trade with the rest of the world. We add up the value of everything we sell to other countries, that's our exports, and then we subtract the value of everything we buy from them, our imports. Simple as that. Okay, section four, the production engine. So that's the demand side of the economy, all the spending that's happening. But of course, for people to spend money on stuff, someone has to be making that stuff. And that brings us to the other half of our map, aggregate supply. Aggregate supply is basically the grand total of all the goods and services that every single business in a country is able to produce. And this is shaped by things like our level of technology, how many workers we have, and the cost of raw materials. Now, here's a really crucial distinction. Time. See, in the short run, some costs for businesses, like employee wages that are set by a contract, are kind of sticky. They don't change very fast. But in the long run, everything is up for grabs. Contracts can be rewritten, and the economy can fully adjust to its potential. Section 5. Diagnosing the Gaps All right, so we have our two big forces, aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Now comes the cool part. We can put them together and use this model to see what's actually going on when the economy gets sick. And this slide shows you exactly how that works. Look over on the left. That's a healthy economy, where demand meets supply right where it should be, at its long-run potential. But now, look at the right. Let's say total spending, aggregate demand, suddenly drops. That whole demand curve shifts to the left. And now, the new meeting point is way below the economy's potential. That creates what economists call a recessionary gap. And a recessionary gap, it's not just some abstract term on a graph. It's real. 
It means factories aren't running, businesses aren't hiring, and people are out of work. It translates directly to lost jobs and lost income for real families. Okay, section six, the great economic debate. So we've used our tool, we've diagnosed the problem, but what's the cure? Well, that question kicks off one of the biggest, oldest debates in all of economics, the classical school versus the Keynesian school. So on one side, you've got the classical view, which basically says the economy is a self-healing organism. If you just leave it alone, it'll fix itself. Then on the other side, you have the Keynesian view, which says, no, the economy is more like a car with a stalled engine. Sometimes it needs a jump start, and that jump start has to come from the government. And believe it or not, you can actually see this huge disagreement in the shapes of the supply curves they use. The classical model on the left has that perfectly vertical supply curve. That implies that in the long run, output is just fixed, no matter what the price is. But the Keynesian curve on the right is flat at the beginning, which suggests that prices are sticky and won't just fall on their own, meaning the economy can get stuck in a really bad place. The famous economist John Maynard Keynes argued that economies aren't just driven by neat, rational math. He said they're driven by waves of human emotion, optimism, and pessimism, what he famously called animal spirits. When fear takes over, everyone stops spending, and that demand curve just shifts way to the left. And his point was, you can't just sit around and wait for confidence to magically come back. Sometimes you need a push. And this big philosophical split leads to two totally different toolkits. The Keynesians, they tend to favor fiscal policy, where the government directly gets involved to boost spending with things like tax cuts or big infrastructure projects. The classical economists, on the other hand, they usually prefer monetary policy, where the central bank works behind the scenes, trying to influence the economy by adjusting interest rates. And that brings us right back to the central question that policymakers are still wrestling with every single time the economy starts to stumble. Should we step in or should we step back? And this is not just some old debate from a textbook. It's happening right now. And by understanding this 80 slash AS model, you now have the framework to actually understand what on earth they're all arguing about.